All right, well, this evening we are looking at the next two verses in Luke chapter 17. So let me read it, but let, let me, if I, can, if I may, I don't know if it's, um, even if it doesn't correspond with what we see on the screen, let me just back up again to verse 1 and we'll just read the first four verses. So Luke, Luke 17, beginning in verse 1, he said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. But woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Well, may the Lord bless his word uh, to our understanding this evening. Now, remember Jesus warned this morning about the inevitability of stumbling blocks, as we've just been reminded that there, were, that there will be those who, uh, because of certain things that they embrace, you know, certain doctrines of Scripture, um, especially if they should embrace something that strikes at the heart of the gospel, which is very serious, or through personal examples, Remember, uh, there, we do have a tendency uh, to look up to certain saints. Um, I think my tendency is to look up to those who are already past, you know, those in the past like the Puritans, Jonathan Edwards, you've heard me refer to him several times. But also there's people in the present, you know, who are living a, um, at least people that we admire as being godly people. We have to remember they can also influence us by certain things they do, maybe to, to follow their example and we also understand that in the world, there are those who will try to encourage us to do things that are wrong, bad company that would tempt us. All of these things, Jesus reminded us, are things that could feasibly motivate us to stumble and to fall into sin. He warned us that we should be on our guard uh, against, against them. Now, he particularly focused on how horrible it would be for those who are the direct cause of stumbling any who believe in him. And he was saying this particularly because of the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of Israel, who were leading people away from him, stumbling uh, those that um, belonged to him. He said it would be better for a very large stone to be tied around their neck and for them to be dropped into the middle of the sea, of course, with the purpose of drowning them, because it, it would be better because if they succeeded, uh, their punishment in hell would be that much worse. Now we also saw that this stands as a warning to us, even though Jesus wasn't directly addressing his people, he wasn't directing us as far as stumbling others, we know that there are passages of scripture that remind us that we certainly can stumble others. So this also stands as a warning to us to make sure that we don't stumble our brethren. If we embrace things that are dangerous, you know, uh, dangerous ideas. And we share these ideas with others, which we like to do, of course, because things that are exciting to us, we share. Or when we do things, we allow ourselves to do things that the Lord tells us not to do, or we don't do the things that he calls us to do. And even if we, um, well, again, if we uh, exhibit perhaps a, a spirit that is less excited, less zealous, that's rather cool, you know, all of these things can become a means of stumbling one another rather than encouraging one another. We need to remember that none of us live in a vacuum, right? We're, we're in a society, a society of believers. That means we have interaction. Um, you know, what we believe and what we do affects those who are around us. Now, again, we're reminded that Jesus won't condemn us if we belong to him for these things, we're still forgiven, but we do need to be careful. He wants us to be careful to make sure we're encouraging one another and loving one another, encouraging one another to love and to good deeds rather than to sin. Okay? We need to be encouragements to godly behavior. Jesus, I believe, now turns to deal with a what if. Okay? What if a brother or a sister begins to influence us? to believe things that aren't true, things perhaps that are dangerous, or maybe to encourage us to do things that are wrong. This seems to be the connection between what we saw this morning in the first two verses and what Jesus now says here. 
it's likely that he certainly means something even broader, talking about sin in general. What if they sin against us in that way or in some other way? What if they hurt our reputation? What if they take something that belongs to us? What if they insult us or injure us? Uh, what, what should we do? Well, instead of becoming angry or bitter, instead of writing them off, Jesus tells us that in love, we are obligated to do what we can do to bring them to repentance, to try and turn them away from their sin, and then if they turn, forgive them, no matter how many times uh, they might injure us. Now, our Lord, first of all, tells us that we should try to turn our brothers and sisters from their sins. He says in verse 3, be on your guard. If your brother sins, and again, I think we should take this generically, brother or sister, rebuke him or her, and if they repent, forgive them. Now, be on your guard literally means that we need to watch out for ourselves, and we need to watch out for ourselves around, Jesus says, our brethren, right? Be on your guard if your brother sins, okay? Now, we probably don't think that we need to be guarded around our brothers and sisters in the Lord. I think that's probably the last thing we would think. They should be the last people on earth that should want to do anything to hurt us in any way, but we know that that isn't always the case, is it? Uh, having been through a church split, as I have, I can tell you that there are those who profess, profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who can still want to injure you. It, it's a sad thing, very sad, because that's one of the things that the world looks at and uses as a reason not to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ because they look at Christians behaving as they behave and they, they think, how are they better than me? Well, those are not our best moments. We do need to be careful. But the reason this happens is because, again, as we were reminded recently, Christians are not perfect. I may have used this illustration already um, where R.C. Sproul was reminding us in, um, I think it was on Dust the Glory, he was talking about David and how David um, was, 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 well, he, he did everything in a big way, right? Um, he, he had great acts of faith. I mean, he, he killed a lion, he killed a bear, he killed Goliath, he became king of Israel, he defeated the nations around him. But um, he also, when he sinned, he sinned in a big way, right? He took uh, another man's wife, and then to cover over his sin, he murdered her husband. Uh, this reminds us that those who belong to the Lord Jesus are not necessarily perfect people. And he pointed out how the philosopher Kierkegaard loved reading the Old Testament because he found that the people who were in it, he said, were not just paper saints. I had a, um, uh, I asked uh, actually the, the librarian at Westminster years ago what he thought of a particular um, a biography of Jonathan Edwards uh, by Ian Murray. He says, I don't like it. I said, why? He says, it's because it's too hagiographical was the word that he used. I said, what does that mean? He says that Ian Murray was painting him as some kind of a, perfect saint and didn't really bring out his flaws. And I said, oh, did he, did he have a lot of flaws that should have been brought out? I think Jonathan Edwards is perhaps one of the most sincere believers who ever lived. Well, see, Kierkegaard was saying the Old Testament certainly doesn't represent the people who trusted the Lord in that way. What he saw them were, were as real people. Uh, they're represented as real people who had the same flaws and struggled with the same sins that he had to struggle with in his own life. And that certainly is true. Christians aren't perfect, right? We're not perfect. And every other believer is not perfect. We're, and because we're still flawed, we can still injure each other. And so the Lord says, be on your guard. Now, Jesus may also mean that we should be careful as to how we respond to those injuries, that we don't respond to them in a sinful way. Be on your guard you know, with regard to your brothers and sisters uh, when they sin against you, because it may not be a matter of if, but a matter of when, don't respond in an ungodly way. Being imperfect, really, our first reaction might be to get angry or want to get even. But Jesus tells us that our reaction should not be either. But in love, we should try to restore them, try to bring them to repentance. Repentance. 
Now, we need to understand that that is what we do, I think, um, with, the, with those whom we love, certainly. Uh, think about uh, parents, uh, you know, when, when you're raising your children, sometimes your children get angry at you, don't they? Sometimes they might call you nasty names. Sometimes they might say that they hate you. And when they say that, that, that hurts. But that hurt, of course, uh, doesn't mean that we hurt them back. It doesn't mean we brush them off. It doesn't mean we have nothing to do with them. Uh, but really what we do is we, we try to work through that. Same thing is true with, with spouses, uh, with our spouses. We don't brush them off if they do something that offends us. We try to work through these things and reconcile with them because we love them. Now, the same thing is true with regard to our brothers and sisters. Okay? If they offend us, if they injure us, or do something that could potentially stumble us, we need to love them enough to bring them to repentance, which means to get them to turn around, turn away, and go the right direction. Now, the how to do this might be the difficult part, um, to do it the right way, particularly, because Jesus tells us uh, in verse 3, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Okay, rebuke him. Now, a rebuke is something stronger than an admonition, which means a warning. Uh, to rebuke means to reprimand, to express your disapproval of, of what they've done, to warn them of the consequences of what they've said, what they've done, uh, what they want, what they believe, and to urge them to turn away from that behavior. Now, why would that be a difficult thing to do? I think we understand that our reluctance comes from the fact that when we maybe have tried to do this in the past, that it tends to build a wall between us and that person and sometimes can even end that relationship depending upon how much love there is really involved uh, in it. Jesus tells us, though, that it's better to risk that by rebuking them than to allow them to continue in sin. We do need to understand that if they have God's Spirit, they will eventually come around because that's what the Spirit of God does. They will realize what they have done. Sometimes they just need time, you know, after the uh, reproof, after the rebuke. And, um, uh, and they'll come to understand, too, that what you've attempted to do for them is really a, a good thing and not a bad thing. You know, David realized that if he was doing something wrong, that it would be better if somebody came to him and pointed that out, even... Uh, you know, uh, basically struck him, so to speak, than to allow him to continue in that sin to, and, and, of course, dishonor his Lord. He says in Psalm 141.5, and let me just ask you if, if, you know, if this is your heart also in this regard, he says this, let the righteous smite me in kindness and reprove me. It is oil upon the head. And by the way, oil on the head in those days was actually a good thing. Do not let my head refuse it. So David is saying, it's a good thing, and he wanted that. May not necessarily have liked it each time, but you know, there's that very uh, prominent occasion that we think of when after he had sinned with Bathsheba, after he had Uriah murdered, Nathan comes to him with the parable of the, of the lamb, and uh, the person who had this huge flock, this rich man, but instead he takes the poor man's lamb when a Visitor comes and he kills it and, and cooks it and dresses it for his visitor. David gets angry and he says, that's not going to happen here. He goes, tell me who that man is. And Nathan says, you're the man, okay? You took this man's wife. So when that happened, David didn't get in a furor and have Nathan thrown into prison. But he immediately repented. And that's obviously what the Spirit of God does within us. Uh, he allows us to receive that rebuke. But again, uh, we need to make sure that when we do that, that we do it in the right way. Because if we've lost control, you know, if we're already incensed, you know, we shouldn't attempt it because we might be tempted in that rebuke maybe to get a few licks in. We have to do it in love. I know rebuke doesn't sound like love, but rebuke is love, and it needs to be done in a loving way. Paul writes in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. 
bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So come to them in gentleness, come to them in love and point out their sins and point out the, the conclusion and, and basically appeal to them to turn. Now, if the Lord blesses, if he changes their hearts, if, if they turn, if they repent. Now, here's where we can bring in what we were looking at this morning. If they repent, which means not just that they say they repent, but repentance means uh, if they acknowledge you know, what it is that they have done and, and they turn away from it and they come to you and ask for forgiveness, because that's what repentance is, then Jesus says that we are to forgive them. He says, if he repents, forgive him. Forgiveness is so essential you know, to, to our relationships, to our walk with the Lord. It's essential to our relationship with the Father, isn't it? Without forgiveness, we can't have a relationship with him. Forgiveness is the only way that our relationships can move forward after an injury. Without forgiveness, they'll eventually reach critical load. You know, if, if these sins, if these offenses are not forgiven, uh, there will finally be that one that breaks the camel's back, so to speak. And uh, when there is so much resentment and bitterness that, that two in a relationship can't stand each other anymore, that's when relationships end. It's not the only reason why they end, but certainly that is a reason why they end. But forgiveness, you see, allows us to start again with a clean slate, you know, to start over and, and, and to move forward. Now, forgiveness, remember, uh, isn't simply setting the offense aside for now and putting it in your, your arsenal so that you can bring it out when you need some ammunition in a later argument. Forgiveness is letting go of the wrong. It's canceling the debt. It's leaving it behind, burying it, so to speak, in the sea of forgetfulness and purposing really never to bring it up again. It means basically uh, going forward that we're going to treat the person that we forgive in the same way the Lord treats us when he forgives us. Does the Lord remember our sins against us? No, uh, the Bible says that he forgets them, not absolutely, but he doesn't bring them up against us again. David writes this in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12, a very uh, comforting passage. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Um, how far is the east from the west? Well, th to the Jewish mind, it's, you know, there's no way to calculate it. So essentially, the Lord is saying, I'm removing them from you uh, at an infinite distance, and they will not be brought up against you again. That's the way the Lord wants us to treat others, to treat our brother and si or sister who repents. And that's you know, certainly uh, the way that uh, we ought to treat one another. But then Jesus raises another question. What if they repent? But then they repent of their repentance, and they injure us uh, again. Uh, what should we do in a case like that? Should we assume the first repentance was no repentance at all? They never really repented? I don't think we should assume that. We should assume what we already assumed, that they're weak and flawed, and they're likely to do the same thing again. I mean, do you know anybody uh, who has injured you in the same way over and over again? I mean, it, it happens, doesn't it? But that doesn't mean that we give up or that we stop forgiving, right? Uh, our Lord Jesus says, if they sin again, we need to rebuke them again. And if they repent again, we need to forgive them again. Well, how, how much, right? How often? Well, Jesus says, if he sins against you seven times in a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now, is Jesus here, of course, setting a limit? You know, the limit, basically, seven is the limit, and after that, you don't have to forgive? Well, no, no, obviously not. He's, he's not saying that. Uh, Peter asked Jesus that very question, you know, in, in our meditation. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? 
up to seven times. And remember, Peter thought seven was really a lot. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, <clears throat> but up to 70 times seven. And in this conversation, I want you to notice that neither Peter nor Jesus were th limiting this to a day. They were talking about a lifetime, a lifetime limit. And that lifetime limit is not 490. Basically, what Jesus meant by this was there is no limit. Just as there's no limit to how many times the Father will forgive us. Jesus says we shouldn't put any limits on our forgiveness. He says in Luke 6.36 that we are to be merciful just as our Father is merciful. And he is very merciful, is he not? Now, another question arises. What if we're not willing to do this? What if we're not willing to forgive if our brother or sister who has sinned against us comes and asks for forgiveness? What if we can't find in our hearts to let go of the injustices because the scale hasn't been balanced? Well, Jesus tells us in the Lord's Prayer uh, what will happen. He tells us, uh, first of all, that we need to pray. And again, we need to be reminded of this because this gets to the heart of the matter. In Matthew 6, 12, that when we pray for forgiveness, we are to pray this way, forgive us our debts, which means forgive us our sins, as we also have forgiven our debtors, those who have sinned against us. Jesus is saying we need to pray, Father, forgive us in the same way and to the same degree that we have forgiven other people. Wow, is that how we want to be forgiven? The way that we forgive other people? Well, that's what our Lord tells us that we need to do. He then says this as sort of a, a post comment on what he had said earlier in the Lord's Prayer in verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Remember the, the parable I alluded to about the servant who was forgiven a great debt, uh, more than he could ever repay, 10,000 talents or something to that effect, and then goes to a fellow servant and refuses to forgive him a debt that amounts to a couple of days' wages. Okay? What happened to him? His master threw him into prison. And he would not come out of there until he paid the last cent. And what that means, of course, is that he took him and threw him into hell because of his unforgiveness. If we don't forgive, Jesus is saying, he will not forgive us, by which we understand, remembering that we're not saved by our works. If we cannot forgive, it simply means that the Lord has not forgiven us because when the Lord pardons, he gives us a pardoning spirit. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy. You know, it's not easy to forgive, but we have that ability if we have the Spirit of God. It's one of the ways that we can know that we are forgiven is the fact that we have a forgiving spirit, that we can let those things go, that we can put them in the past and not bring them up again. Now, there's one more thing I want us to see in this passage, and it does give us perhaps a bit of relief, but not, not, maybe not absolutely, because I don't think it's that really that difficult to forgive people who actually ask for forgiveness. You know, it's, it's, the problem comes when they don't. But Jesus actually tells us that there is a condition to this pardon, to this forgiveness, even as there's a condition to our forgiveness with, with the Lord a condition that has to be met before we are required to forgive, and that condition is repentance, okay? And remember, well, let me just read the passage again. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. So he is talking about a situation here where somebody actually comes and, and expresses their sorrow, and asks for our forgiveness. Uh, we do need to understand that just as we can only be reconciled with the Father if we repent of our sins, if we again express our sorrow and turn from that direction and purpose not to do it again, but to do the right thing, uh, the same thing is true with regard to our relationships with our brethren. There can only be reconciliation if there is repentance. Repentance. 
which means when we point out their sin through the rebuke, that they express that sorrow, admit their fault, and ask for forgiveness. If they don't repent, Jesus is basically telling us we don't have to forgive them. Now, I know that sounds rather harsh, but we do need to understand what that means. Um, it doesn't mean that we're free to hold a grudge against them. It doesn't mean that we can become bitter and spiteful. What it does mean is this, that even though we're not reconciled because they haven't repented, that we still desire to be reconciled to them. So essentially, there won't be that reconciliation without the repentance. But if there's no repentance, we still need to desire it. And let me give you a couple of examples from our Lord. Again, on the cross, I think the, the best example. What did Jesus pray on the cross? He prayed in Luke 23, 34, which we'll see perhaps a few months in the future. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Now, was Jesus praying for people who had repented? No, he was praying for those who had nailed him to the cross. Had they asked for forgiveness? No, they hadn't. And yet, he prayed for reconciliation because he desired reconciliation, even though they did not desire reconciliation. Remember also what he said to James and John <clears throat> when Jesus went to a particular town of the Samaritans. They, they, were, you know, they had difficulties with the Samaritans to begin with. And when they rejected Jesus, what did James and John want to do? They said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? I mean, what they were thinking of was retribution. They wanted to see judgment fall on them. But remember what Jesus said to them in Luke 9, verses 55 and through 56. He turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Even though they didn't repent, even though they didn't seek forgiveness, the Lord's heart towards them was still that he desired. And there were those that later came as the gospel went out. They later did repent and turned to him. Jesus, the point is this, that even if they don't repent, Jesus showed them mercy. And our Lord is telling us that he wants us to go and do the same. So when our brother or sister uh, sins against us, we need to rebuke them. If they repent, we need to forgive them. And even if they don't repent, we need to desire that they would come to repentance. That's a very tall order. Uh, but again, whatever our Lord calls us to do, he also gives us the ability to do it. So let's pray that God would help us, uh, if we're struggling in this area, uh, to help us do what we need to do, what he calls us to do by his strength. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer.